Good evening, everyone, um, to another one of our Wish Wednesdays. Um, a big warm welcome to everyone joining us um, from around the country and indeed from around the world. A big uh, welcome to our colleagues at SASMA, um, also to our colleagues from Biokinetics, um, Cairo, Pratry, um, all sorts. We really have a very diverse crowd of people joining us for our Wish Wednesdays. So Wish Wednesday uh, forms part of the academic offering um, offered by the WITS Sport and Health. And we are very excited to bring you another webinar with the help of our sponsors, a kind educational grant by this pharmaceutical company, Asino Lita, um, provides that we can um, provide these webinars to you free of charge. Um, so we thank them very much for their support. You may get a bit of a surprise this evening when you are greeted with my face. My name is Robin Saggers. I'm the academic director for WISH. Um, you've become accustomed to seeing Prof. John Patricius um, greeting you on a Wednesday evening, or Tuesday or Wednesday evening with these webinars. But this evening he is taking a back seat and he's given me the controls. Um, so let's see if I can handle his job and he can handle mine. As always, uh, please direct your questions into the Q&A tab at the bottom. And at the end of the presentation, we will have a period where we can um, ask our speaker tonight um, some questions and answers and uh, get interactive. So please encourage your questions into the Q&A tab at the bottom. Tonight, we discuss an important topic of exercise is medicine. And who better to speak to us than the current chair of the Exercises Medicine Initiative in South Africa. So we welcome this evening, Dr. Georgia Torres. Just to give you a bit more background about her, Georgia is currently a lecturer at the Center for Exercise Science and Sports Medicine at Wits University. She completed her B Phys Ed degree at Wits then went on to do an honors in sports science at the University of Pretoria. She then completed a master's degree in exercise physiology and a PhD in the field of metabolic syndrome and exercise programming at Fitz Medical School. She also holds conditioning and strength specialist qualifications, medical exercise specialist qualifications, and also a health coaching qualification. She's been working in the health and fitness industry for more than 20 years and has been the strength and conditioning specialist for provincial and national hockey teams. So it's safe to say that we're in very good hands um, and we are in store for a very interesting in, uh, presentation from Dr. Georgia Torres. So Georgia, over to you. We welcome what you have to say and um, if you can start sharing your screen. Awesome. Thank you, Robin. Um, and thank you for that lovely introduction. I think you're doing a great job so far, if I may say so myself. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. All right. So um, I'm going to, I just want to get my laser pointer out because I like to point things. I'm going to talk a little bit about exercise as medicine, a prescription for health tonight. But I'd like to start off with a scenario that I think a lot of you um, would uh, be familiar with. Um, a female looking a little bit like my little funny photo on the left um, comes into your office, age 38, having missed a step at home like we sometimes do, and uh, she's complaining of a sore and swollen ankle. Now, in that treatment journey, there may be a scenario where um, you will treat the pain or you will refer to a specialist because of the uh, where the ankle injury is. Um, the patient may then land up seeing a physiotherapist for the acute rehab. Um, after the pain and the mobili mobilization and acute rehab is done, the patient may then be referred to a bikineticist or exercise physiologist for further rehab. Um, and in the back of your mind already, having looked at that photo, having done your comprehensive medical history assessment, you're thinking other things. Um, and the question that I always think about is, 
have we addressed what is going to kill this lady? And have we improved her health in this journey that we set her on? Um, for many real reasons that we're not going to discuss and relevant reasons that we're not going to discuss tonight, we, we um, are, are faced with that fact that we haven't or we didn't have time or the, 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 the problem that was in front of us had to be dealt with. So my question is, which is this bad health behavior that kills most adults? Because if we're going to ask the question is, have we improved the health? Have we sorted out what's, what's going to kill her? Then we must understand what is that. And this research by Ding et al. in 2015 throws some light into the matter for us. And you can see that uh, what this group of researchers did is they went and looked at if you like um, risky health behaviors from physical inactivity, prolonged sitting, smoking, too much sleep, too little sleep, high alcohol, poor diet. And then they um, recorded the health, the hazard ratios and compared it to there being no risk factors. And you can see that with physical inactivity and prolonged sitting came up two and a half times a greater chance of dying, a greater risk of dying from any cause mortality, both sexes greater than 45 years old, when compared to any of the other behaviors, health behaviors. How much have we done in the light of smoking, uh, recently in the light of um, high alcohol intake? Um, and why is this here so important? And we tend to, as health practitioners, not give it the importance and the front-facing um, health discussion with our patients. So when we're talking, for me, when we're talking about uh, behavior change, one of the big things is that we have to connect uh, the values of someone to their goals. And the reason for that is that um, that the person's only going to change the behavior if they understand why they're doing it and they see value and benefit from changing that behavior. To be able to um, answer this question as, and I'm looking at it from us, from a health practitioner point of view, not from the patient point of view, for us to, to put physical activity in the forefront of our consulting, um, the why is, in, is increasing physical activity important? The why is exercise prescription important? We'll need to understand and be convinced of the how. And I want to look at just the first part of this lecture briefly through a different lens of the how does exercise do this? And I'm going to really um, uh, take uh, information um, from these two articles, one in physiology reviews and one in uh, frontiers cardiovascular medicine. Um, and look at it from the point of view of what are the main biological mediators of the preventative and therapeutic um, uh, effects of physical activity against NCDs, against cancers, and why, what are those biological mediators um, with the effect of physical activity against anti-aging? And there's really, if I have to summarize those articles, there's four pathways, there's four biological me mediator pathways that one needs to look at. One is the skeletal muscles, the myokines. One is through stem cells. One is the reactive oxygen species paradox, which we'll briefly touch on. And the last is autophagy. And I want to look at, at this because this for me um, made me understand and made me go, wow, we have a tool, we have this exercise, we have this thing called physical activity that we, we do we really understand its power? Do we really understand its effect? And that's why I want to show it to you today. So let's look at the first um, section and that's of skeletal myokines. And um, this, this fancy, intricate, eloquent presentation is just looking at pathways, signaling pathways, molecules, mediators um, involved with exercise. And the, uh, the, the, the black arrows are stimulatory and the um, 
dotted errors or inhibitions. So I'm just going to take two examples, okay? You can see that exercise is many fixed, but let me just take two examples so that we have an, an idea here. If you look at myostatin, which is a myokine that is produced when we uh, do acute um, endurance exercise or acute resistance exercise, and it increases, it's in the bloodstream when we do chronic endurance exercise. And what happens with exercise is that its, its expression is decreased. Now, myostatin decreases um, muscle tissue. Um, so if with the exercise decreasing its expression, it allows this pathway to happen, which then allows through irisin, the brining of white adipose tissue, which increases liposis. And it also through pathways on the other side, allows for the um, amelioration of muscle strength. Let's look at interleukin-6, which, you, which you know, is, is, is also quite an important myokine. Now, interleukin-6 um, is expressed in, um, uh, by increasing exercise duration, by increasing exercise intensity. It is expressed, it, is, it increases when there is low glucose levels in the muscle. Um, it is also increases when there is muscle damage. So when we exercise, interleukin-6, um, especially during endurance exercise, increases and it acts like leptin because it, it uh, decreases lipid deposition and it increases fat oxidation. But also what it does is it influences and increases anti-inflammatory cytokines, which are important in um, our, our immunity fight. Um, and by doing that, our, our immunity is protected. It also increases the expression of pro-inflammatory agents like a tumor necrosis A, which is, which is connected to insulin resistance and other things. So those are just two examples. And the last one I want to just touch on is um, the brain-derived uh, neurotrophic factor that um, mostly with exercise is released and influences um, the brain, and it's involved in protecting neurons in the brain. It has been linked to neurogenesis in the brain, um, and I'll show you some, some, some articles later on this. But what fascinates me about this is that these things with exercise are released in the muscles, but they cross talk through a lot of systems. So they're talking to um, our brain system, they're talking to our endocrine system, they're talking to our um, our, uh, um, our metabolism as such. They're talking to our uh, muscle um, production. So that's a little bit around my kinds. Now let's look at the second um, biological mediator pathway and that's to do with um, uh, stem cells. And there's recently been a strategy to stimulate adult stem cell proliferation um, and migration from home tissues, like from a, a bone marrow, to, to target damaged tissues for subsequent engraftment and cell regeneration by applying specific physiological stimuli, of which exercise has been one. And here again is a, is a, is a little summary of an intricate, eloquent, complicated, but it shows the depth of what regular exercise can do. So if, you, if we look here, an acute bout of exercise will cause what, what is a CAC, circulating angio, angiogenic cells, stem cells, to, from the bone marrow to move to the um, lining of the blood vessels. Now we know that exercise in itself produces nitric oxide and that is protective in terms of blood cell lining and very important in one of the things that exercise does. But the CACs do the same thing and the CACs are also involved in repairing the endothelium and the CACs are also involved in angiogenesis, um, uh, making, of, making uh, more blood vessels. Um, one of the things that has been shown is that uh, low CAC levels are found in people with cardiovascular disease, diabetes, um, and um, um, high CACs are found in those 
with uh, low risk of cardiovascular disease. The same happens with the circulating uh, muscle-derived mesenchymal stem cells. And those have the ability to repair damaged skeletal muscle and, and um, damaged myocardium. Um, so when we're talking about regenerative medicine, um, phenomenal that uh, exercise falls slap bang in the middle of such an important um, structure, of such an important process, sorry. And then we have um, this um, um, reactive oxygen system. Um, and really all we want to say about that is that the reactive oxygen system is muscle derived and it increases with prolonged inactivity and it contributes to muscle atrophy. However, the same stimulus from working muscles produces the right amount. It's the hermesis theory whereby um, uh, you know, uh, too, much of a, too much of a thing is dangerous, but just the right amount is actually good. Um, and the stimulus of exercise in working muscle fibers uh, produces the right amount of ROSs um, as a training adaptation. And they play an important sign signaling role in angiogenesis, improved vascular distensibility and um, um, re, uh, regenesis or, or making more mitochondria. Um, one of the important things with RAS and CACs is that, um, and interleukin-6, for example, is that um, an inflammatory state is always linked to our NCDs, um, our chronic diseases. And the effect that exercise has in curbing this uh, uh, pro-inflammatory states that happen is, is very powerful through these uh, biological uh, pathways and molecular signaling pathways. Right, so the next uh, biological adaptation um, system that we were talking about is autophagy. It comes from the Greek word to eat oneself. Um, but really this, um, this uh, uh, blog or article that was written um, in 2017, um, picked up on, on this next article that I show you um, and explained how exercise rejuvenates cell extending lifespan. And the article it refers to is this article here. Um, and what has happened, well, what this article shows is that up to uh, one hour after a endurance exercise, um, the, the damaged mitochondria, the non-functioning mitochondria, are actually cleaned up. So um, the author likened it to like, you know, um, cleaning up a traffic jam. So the muscles operate more efficiently and therefore um, that is a big contribution to, um, to health outcomes and mortality. And then furthermore though, um, autophagy, exercise and autophagy has been not only linked to muscle tissues, but to brain, pancreas, liver, heart, and adipose tissue. Um, and in that way, it has become a big part of exercise role in anti-aging processes. So if we look at those four biological pathways, um, we can understand why um, exercise has been viewed recently by the a miracle by, by the uh, BMJ that was written by Fiona Godley um, in uh, 2019 as the miracle cure. And, and she's saying that if someone claims that a treatment is 100% safe and effective, it must always be viewed with some intense skepticism. And her exception is, is physical activity. Um, and she's saying that um, there seem to be far fewer um, downsides or um, uh, the word I'm looking for is, uh, is um, uh, bad symptoms or side effects, that's the word I'm looking for, um, then for other widely used preventions uh, and cures and treatments. Um, and she, here she's just highlighting that indeed physical activity is one of the alternatives to antidepressants and painkillers. And then she does highlight the Academy of Medical Sciences um, that brought out a whole, um, a whole um, resource that is in that 
uh, reference at the bottom here for you. You can you can get it from the web. And two things that they they um, stated is that regular exercise can prevent all of those things. We know that. Um, reducing the risk of each by at least 30%. And the statement there is that this is better than many drugs. However, do we as practitioners look at that and, and put it in the forefront as prescribing it as, as a treatment? And then they also say that exercise is a miracle cure too often overlooked by doctors and people that they care for. Recently, this article looked at um, the effect of exercise from an interesting perspective. You know, we always look at uh, how does physical activity, inactivity um, influence mortality. But what about how does physical activity being active influence death rates? And they used the prevented fraction for the population to determine deaths that are averted by, um, by being physically active. And they worked out that Conservatively, 3.9 million premature deaths are averted annually, and low-income countries tended to have higher prevented fractions. So the power of exercise is, is, is not only in the crosstalk between all the systems and organs of our bodies, but also in its ability to actually um, change um, mortality um, and morbidity. So I'd like to just summarize a couple of things and, and show you just across these four important areas I think that uh, has, have come up and, and are important uh, currently. So exercise, as you can see, has brain changing, heart changing, genetic changing, and immunity changing effects. And when we talk about the brain, those of you who haven't seen it, um, do yourselves a favor and go watch Wendy Suzuki um, on TED Talk uh, talking about the brain changing benefits of exercise. She's a neuroscientist that changed a whole research niche um, once she herself uh, started exercising and, and then started feeling what we feel with exercise, which is brilliant. You know, it's not like if someone prevents me from eating my buckler, but it doesn't make me feel good. But if someone, um, if I exercise, I feel good. So she started feeling good and then started to, to delve more into why this was happening. And one of the articles, one of the things she, she refers to is this article here and how um, she, she says exercise actually um, increases hypocampal volume in humans, um, which means it's, it protects the area for her that is mostly prone to our, our degenerative um, uh, brain diseases. So um, is another article here that looked at um, running and and the and I love the title is it running changes the brain and that's the long and the short of it. And um, one that I picked up the other day um, in uh, 2020 in medicine science uh, for sports and exercise. Um, that says that exercise, not just for joints, the associations of moderate to vigorous physical activity and sedentary behavior with brain cortical thickness. And in the same vein as the previous article, the results, their results indicate that adults with greater moderate to vigorous physical activity, independent of sedentary behavior, which is important because we are forced in a way, especially in this last while, to sit. But independent of that, um, that physical activity was associated with greater cortical thickness in regions uh, which are susceptible to age-associated atrophy. Um, we also know that a particular dose of exercise can change the measures of depression we use, well, a lot of people use the Hamilton rating scale like the study for depression. Um, and here you can see, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the dose. I'm going to talk about the dosage of exercise, but you can see here's a dose of exercise and it actually reduces the um, depression rating by 47% from baseline. 
so um, which is which is which is phenomenal. Then, if you look at some of the heart changing effects of exercise, um, you know, if there was a pill or if there was something that can change heart tissue. Would we look at it as a prescription? Would we shout it from the rooftops? Um, this is where I, I, uh, I get a bit passionate in Greek, is that here is, is a, such a powerful tool that actually changes heart tissue and keeps us young. So this was in May 2018. It was from Medical News, and it cited this article here. Exercise induces new cardiomyocytes in adults' mammalian heart. New heart cells. Well, there, there you have it. Um, at, the, at the cellular level, I mean, as you saw, the, the, the pathways we, we, just, we just touched on um, are so intricate and they actually um, work at the deepest level of our cells. So here is a, an, a research article that um, uh, found in male football players, lifelong, lifelong trained male football players, when they were compared to age matched inactive controls, they had reduced telomere shortening, um, which is, uh, uh, you know, one of the basis of our anti-aging and, uh, you know, um, senescence process. So if we can stop that, if something can stop that, we certainly should prescribe it. And here's exercise stopping the reduction of telomere shortening. Now, this article I was excited about. I don't know why it was written and, and done so nicely. And this really looked at, um, 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 meta, met, a whole lot of metaomics, and it took um, over, um, I'll, I'll get the right number, but over um, 1,980 molecules that were measured during baseline, during exercise, and during recovery of exercise. And they looked at all the changes that happen with this episode of exercise and, and acutely after the episode of exercise and i love the way this writer wrote it but um 9815 molecules sorry um change with a single session of exercise what what other thing what other thing medicine whatever you want to call it anything alters that that many molecules and um the you know, the research paper says that time series analysis revealed thousands of molecular changes and an orchestrated choreography of biological processes involving energy metabolism, oxidative stress, inflammation, tissue repair, and growth factor response, as well as regulatory pathways. Most of these processes were dampened and some reversed in insulin resistance pathways. And overall, the researchers were taken aback by the magnitude of the changes that happened in the molecular profiles of people. It was only about nine minutes of exercise. How much was supposed to change in just nine minutes? And this is the whole um, new concept that, you know, any bout of exercise is good exercise. You know, one minute, two minutes, it's great. Get, get your patient doing that and it will grow from there. Um, and I love the way he ends it off. He's saying that uh, the findings, the author of this paper, the findings emphasize the wide ranging, pervasive, immediate and individualized effects of exercise. And he says it's like, a, it's like beautiful music um, and it's ours. And that's one of the very important uh, messages for me is that it is our tool. It is something that we can use. It's not difficult. It's just there and its power is so big. So how do we get to use it? And then the last thing is if we talk about immunity, we know that that is obviously important in, in, our, current, um, in our current days. But um, I showed you a couple of things with interleukin-6, interleukin-7, interleukin-15. Um, uh, these cytokines direct immune cell trafficking towards the area of infection, and they promote the production of new, new T cells. And this increases resistance to infection. Um, and also further, um, this um, article here that has identified extracellular superoxide dismutase um, as a scavenger and as an antioxidant that is produced during, um, a, during exercise, um, cardiovascular aerobic exercise. And um, 
the findings of that review strongly support the possibility that exercise can prevent or at least reduce the severity of um, um, uh, respiratory distress sy syndrome that, that many patients develop with COVID. Um, this antioxidant destroys harmful free radicals protecting our tissues and helping prevent disease. And every session of cardiovascular exercise increases the production of this. The same recently has happened with in, in interferon, which is also produced uh, during exercise. Um, and then to sum the, 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 the COVID situation and physical activity, um, Dr. Jim Sellers wrote a blog, and I'm just going to point out a couple of things. Um, and that is that he's saying maybe exercise is not the top of my mind as we struggle to protect our families, but maybe it should be. And he gives four reasons. First of all, we've seen that physical activity has the potential to reduce the severity of the infections if we do. Secondly, it is effective for treating diseases that put people at higher risk of, of, of mortality from COVID. We know the, 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 the diabetes, heart disease, um, um, those people who carry more weight, hypertension. Um, and we, those people, we need to use physical activity to um, reduce their effect of their disease so that they have a better prognosis if, God forbid, COVID um, does infect them. Third is this big thing about um, stress and, and the stress levels and the depression levels and the anxiety levels we know have, have for, for many reasons increased in that. And we know also though that physical activity has important mental health benefits as you saw um, and, is, and, and, can, and is very important in helping cope with ongoing stress and avoiding ill health. And then the fourth is, is the, um, helping the balance between cortisol and other hormones that negatively affect the immune system. So um, this paper is available. I just put it here for you because we have now a consensus statement for post-COVID rehab. And it's also known now that the heart is affected uh, with, with um, COVID-19. So um, to, to, to rehabilitate COVID-19 survivors with exercise, um, as this consensus statement point, points out, is important. And it does give really good um, um, uh, processes, if you like, and recommendations for, for rehabilitation. One of the big things that has happened in the exercise medicine world is that of oncology. And um, uh, recently, um, there have been um, international statements and consensus statements coming out that um, exercise and physical activity must be part and parcel um, of cancer treatment. And this is just one of the um, uh, leading articles. Um, and uh, Catherine Schmidt, who you, many of you might recognize, um, uh, president of the ACSM is, is leading that pathway, but more and more research is showing the importance of exercise um, with cancer, not only preventing it, but we're talking about treating it during treatment. So what if, if, if we now say that, Hey, okay, I get it. I understand that, you know, when I say to a patient or someone go exercise, it's got to mean a lot more. I see it now. I understand that it's just not just about going out and exercising. There's a whole myriad of things that are happening that um, are, are so good for someone. So what, what is the start point? And the start point is always, let's understand where the person is at with physical activity. We, we, we take his blood pressure, we take his, his, um, his temperature. Um, what about understanding where he's at? physical activity wise and the physical activity vital sign. This is available on the exercises medicine global website to use a simple tool that asks two questions, multiply it. And we know that if we are not getting to the recommended amounts of 150 minutes um, or 75 minutes of vigorous 150 minutes of moderate um, in the week, there's a flag that comes up and, and there's got to be some discussion around that. So with our, with our scenario, is there a place where we can put this in? We're in that journey somewhere. We are touching on this and, we, and this doesn't take long. And this can be done not necessarily with a doctor. This can be done in pre-filling you know, pre out forms. 
And then obviously the second question now is, okay, um, I've got now, I know that the physical activity, the, the physical activity vital sign is, is low or non-existent. I have to do something. Um, so how much do I give a target? Um, we know that, you know, this frequency, intensity and time of this is going to determine the volume of exercise, the dose of physical activity. And I'm using exercise and physical activity interchangeably here because you'll call it different terms depending on what the patient sees. Okay, so for me, I love exercise. I love the program thing. But for a starting patient, physical activity is a better talk because it is anything and can be many other things than just exercise. So um, you talked a little bit in, in one of the last webinars, talked a little bit about the intensity. How do, how do we determine a great way of determining what intensity we, we're going to um, give someone? And that is one part of the story of the dose that we need to address for people. So what do we know? What do we know about once we've determined the physical activity level of our patient or of our lady? What do we know would be a dosage for her? So the first studies that were done in this area were called the STRIDE studies, quite a, a few of them. And there were studies of a targeted risk reduction intervention through defined exercise, and they started in 2001. And these studies looked at um, a, 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 a range of year, um, a range of fitness level, and they were not healthy people. They were overweight and they had some mild to moderate lipid abnormalities. And then what they did is they separated them into three doses, if you like. And there, and we're going to talk about dose, but their measurement of dose was kilocalories multiplied by their weight, and it was a weekly dose. So kilocalories per kilogram of someone's body mass per week. And you see there were three doses here. One was a low dose, moderate intensity. And it was 14. One was a low dose, vigorous intensity. And you can see that the vigorous was they, they worked at a higher intensity. So when you're looking at the MAF test that you looked at, it would be at that level, that at a lower level. And then there was a high dose where they did more, so they had to accumulate more, but they did it at a vigorous intensity also. Okay. If we want to, um, you know, for those of us that work with percentage heart rates, then what this would be at would be at um, vigorous would be at um, um, 76 to 94 percent of maximal heart rate. I guess that's quite high. And this um, uh, moderate here would be 65 to 75% of maximal heart rate, just to put it into context for you. Now you can see that these two groups here, the low dose and low dose, were just differed in intensity of exercise, right? And this was the highest dose of activity that was given, okay? And what this article, and there were many written on many things, but if we just look at, at weight change and weight, uh, body weight change and change in waste, there was definitely when they used a dose for the week, a point where certain parameters changed and a point where they stayed the same and a point where they got worse. So for example, with weight change here, it was the eight miles per week um, uh, which I, if I remember correctly, was around 12 kilometers per week. And then um, as, as you did more, the, the weight became better. The point here, though, was that the two intensity groups did not differ in changes. So it was more the dose that was important. And if, if people could do it harder, if they worked harder, they finished it quicker, happiness. But it didn't mean that that's the way they had to do it. They could do it at a lower intensity and take longer to finish it. Okay, but the people who did the 23 kilocalories per kilogram of their body weight per minute had the greatest, um, had the greatest uh, health outcomes, if you like, across many parameters, including visceral fat, including HDL size, including LDL size change. And obviously, the people who did not do anything for six months um, uh, were, were very negatively impacted, so much so that they had to stop the study and get these people to exercise because it was not ethically correct. Then last, not last year, sorry, time flies, but then in 2018, um, the second edition of Physical Activity Guidelines for Americans came out, um, backed on the 
physical activity guidelines um, scientific advisory committee that went and looked at all research over the past 10 years and then formulated this 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 particular um, resource which is available on the web but also the um, scientific committees recommendations are published separately so their scientific recommendations are published separately one of the important things when we're talking about dosage now from that perspective and having looked at a whole lot of research is that the relationship of moderate to vigorous physical activity and all-cause mortality has a curvilinear shape and you can see the hazard ratio of mortality on the y-axis and met hours per week uh, that's how volume of exercise was explained um, across the different research that, that could be standardized across all the papers and the studies. Um, just note at the bottom here that the recommendation of 100, 150 to 300 minutes of moderate physical activity falls in this category over here, just like the 9.9 .9 to like 16 met hours per week. Okay, so that's the category here. But there's a couple of things to notice. First of all, that well, that they noticed and they have stated, there's no lower threshold for benefit. Starting somewhere, anywhere, just get your patient moving in the slightest way, and also that this there's um, a steep early slope. So the greatest benefit, well, about seventy percent of the benefit is already reached by eight point. 8.5 met hours per week and you can see it's in this recommended the lower end of the recommended world health organization physical activity um, uh, recommendation levels if you like so it falls in there but there isn't a best amount and it differs individually the point of the matter is is that we don't have to do huge amount of exercise to to, to, to get this benefit and you can see uh, look at this look look down here I mean there's 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 a benefit here 20 percent reduction there there's also no evidence of increased risk at this high end again when we're talking high end here um, we're not talking um, elite uh, ultra distance triathlon endurance stuff <laughs> unfortunately we're talking um, far lower than that but at this particular end there, it, there wasn't evidence of any increased risk okay when when it looked at all cause mortality um, now the the activity the physical activity scientific committee also then went and looked at per uh, chronic disease is there a difference of the dose response relationship between the amount of physical activity and the risk of uh, breast cancer colon cancer diabetes ischemic heart disease and ischemic stroke events and they looked at around about 174 studies and you can see that the same idea so if you look here i've just put in the 8.25 8.5 met hour line the 17 met hour line where it starts now sort of uh, the steepest incline's not there anymore and then the 35 met hour line so those are the three sort of dosages that keep coming up in the literature and you'll notice that you know for ischemic stroke and ischemic heart disease you don't need a lot to get the um the the, the re relative risk decreasing however if you look at for example copy diabetes and breast cancer okay we need to do higher amounts so here the dose is individualized per um, per chronic disease or per, per uh, health profile if you like okay so so basically if you're looking to start someone if you can get them to 8.5 met hours per week um, they haven't got any health issues if you can get them there that is what you've done for their health is probably more than you'll ever do for their health um, and you've improved their, their their mortality by at least 35 40 percent then if there is health um, health conditions we need to consider these and then individualize the dose accordingly if you look at um, um, cardiac heart disease the relative risk of cardiac heart disease and kilocalories per week so now here's a term that is easier for us to understand so it's per kilocalories uh, per week and not 
met hours per week. Um, so if I then go and put in the 8.5, the 17, and the 35 met hours per week, those are the lines there that you're seeing. Same idea here for cardiac heart disease that we saw. This is the, um, um, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the trend line for both uh, males and females. So we'll just look at that line. Um, and you can see that the same things happen, you know, at a, at a lower kilocalorie value, we can be getting a, a reduction in mortality with cardiac heart disease. It's not the same for diabetes, not the same for, for certain cancers. So if we want to make the met our story per week more easier for us, because we can talk in kilocalories per kilogram per week, which you saw in the stride studies, then we just take one met hour per week is approximately very close, but it's 1.05 um, kilocalories per kilogram. So we take them, the, you know, if we say our person's got to exercise at 17, um, at, uh, sorry, at um, uh, 35 met hours per week, we multiply that by 1.05 and we can get the kilocalories per kilogram per week that we can uh, give that or set that as a target, okay? Here are our lines again for heart failure. Can you can see the same? It's not as as steep at the beginning as cardiac heart disease, but it gets better at seventeen, and certainly it's best at higher dosages of exercise. And what's nice about this this document that you can get freely on on the net, um, and it's the Physical Activity Guidelines Advisory Committee, is that each of the concluding statements is graded according to what type of research and what the research is shown. So you can see that there's insufficient evidence to determine whether these relations vary by age, sex, race, ethnicity. So that's uh, you know, a place for research. But there's strong evidence that demonstrates significant relationship between greater amounts of physical activity, decreased incidence of cardiovascular disease, stroke, heart failure. Okay. And um, it follows the same process for all. So what do we have so far? All right. So we have our lady, she came in, and the idea was, as I see it in my eyes, we have to establish a current physical activity dose. We can do that cleverly, and we can discuss it maybe after, but it doesn't have to take up your time. It, it, it can be done elsewhere, and you can, and when they sit by you, even as a physio, you can have that in front of you, and you can maybe decide to talk about it then or to talk about it in a subsequent. Um, okay. But the point is, that we are giving physical activity the place that it deserves because of what it does to the body. Then we then go and look at for our, for our patient establishing a health dose. What, so, so she is here, nothing or somewhere, but for her health, we need 8.5 or 17 or 23 uh, kilocalories per kilogram of her body mass per week to expend then we can use tracking tools and there's so many and whatever the person likes to use, let them use it with a, even if it's a, even if it's a log book, you know, whatever it is, even if it's their phone, which is the best uh, tracking tool that you can have now. Once we track these things, there needs to be some feedback because that will keep the, 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 the person um, accountable and, and trying to reach their healthy physical activity dose. And this is where the coaching can also come in. You know, coaching in terms of health coaching um, is, 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 is where it becomes important to keep the person doing the physical activity recommendation. And then there's got to obviously in health, in health and for science be some measure or some assessment of, of what have we really done. And the simple assessment is obviously we can track the physical activity levels which in whatever way we decided. But what is the best health measure for us to see whether we've actually changed um, mortality using exercise? And I have to tell you that it's cardiorespiratory fitness and here's some proof. And uh, this is a case that cardiorespiratory fitness should become a vital sign. And we're not talking about fancy equipment. We're talking that you can find a way to do it um, in, in, in your practices that is uh, available, simple, and uh, non-expensive. Um, I have this cardio, I've made an infographic um, talking about all the, uh, what has research shown us in the last 10 years uh, with, in terms of cardiorespiratory fitness is on the SESMA 
a website and you can see that it's the, it's, it is a stronger predictor of mortality than established risk factors. It, it takes you through 44 percent decrease in all-cause mortality among people with diabetes when increasing CLF um, by 22 percent. And the interesting part, if you go to the numbers at the bottom, is that um, there is there we go. 59% reduction in death rate in healthy men and women when improving CRF level from low, so these most of the people who come in from low fitness levels to moderate. We don't have to all become big athletes. And then the, the other important part for me is that um, there's a 10 to 25 improvement in survival rate per one met increase in CRF. Now, one met means you increase your VO2, your oxygen consumption, by 3.5 milliliters of oxygen per kilogram per minute. And that, if we can't do that as practitioners for our patients, um, I, don't think, I don't think we're very good its effect on the brain. So this is available for you. It's on the SASMA website as an infographic on CRF. But for me, it is the, the um, um, lead measure, if you like, for health outcomes that we need to consider. We understanding that we've increased physical activity, but are we changing the lead measure at the end? So we've now figured out a dosage for our, for, we've figured out uh, the, the level that our, our lady is at. In terms of physical activity, we figured out a dosage for her. Then comes the action. So what, what can we do as practitioners that is quick, simple, fast, if we don't want to be the ones that are actually controlling and, 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 and uh, doing exercise? If we're not going to refer to someone like an exercise physiologist, like a biochemist, like a, physio a sports physiotherapist who, who will um, closely regulate and control the exercise program. And this is again available on the on the exercisesmedicine.org global website for use. Um, and all it does is it says we'll sit together and we're going to tick these boxes. How simple is this? We talk about frequency. So you talk, you let the patient tell you how many days a week, at what intensity, and we keep it simple. We don't have to get we don't have to get technical here. There it is. We're going to tick it. We're going to commit to a time, not you the patient. What do you like? Um, if it's steps per day, what are we committing to? So together we quickly, and this can take five minutes, we quickly decide what we're going to do. We talk a little bit about strengthening because now this is an important recommendation that we do have to also involve some muscle strength work, not just cardiovascular week. We then sign it and we then decide together how we're going to get started in the week. And then there could be your nurse or someone following up, for example, a, a call you know, how's it going, or if data's coming through to, to some platform, like I use the My Wellness Technogen platform, I can see in live what my patient is doing. And then lastly, I just want to take you through this article. It was published in the BMJ, and it had some interesting thoughts around promoting physical activity to patients. And the first was, I have to ask, when do I ask, when do I discuss physical activity? And as it says there, um, it can be done at, at any time, but the point is, is that it works. Even three to five minute discussions in a routine health appointment with a brief booster call after two weeks, increased physical activity levels four to six weeks later by 37 minutes per week, 30 minutes more than controls. So the opportunity for discussion can be found, obviously, at new appointments. I mean, this is something that we have to work out as ourselves in our practices. But if we see, if, if we understand the why, we think we should be putting exercise in the forefront as a prescription for health, we, we probably will find ways to do it. And then um, there are such simple ways around how do we how do we tackle, you know, talking about this? And you can see at the top, it just goes through a simple ask. Can you should have already got that information from your physical activity um, vital sign? A yes, give pro positive feedback. And no, from what you've told me, being more physically active may help you feel better and improve your health. And then discover the patient's idea and perspective. What is your understanding? Are you interested in being more physical? How confident are you? So this is just little questions that you can ask, simple questions. Are they interested? Yes. 
then you set an achievable goal, a small goal on that piece of paper, for example, in the prescription, you can use smart goals, for example. If no, you then say fine, and you can give them some information. Now, also on the Exercises Medicine Global website, there is one leaflet, one, one page, A4 page, for everything, for hypertension, for fibromyalgia, you name it, a one piece information sheet that you can print out or uh, refer the patient to that website. So there's information that you can give them because if they're not ready to change, uh, you know, bugging them and, and being threatening them and whatever is not going to work. And then obviously if they are, you then let them set their goals. How are they going to monitor their progress? How would they like you to, um, to, to, to um, uh, motivate them or would, how would they want them to be accountable to you in what manner? recording their steps, sending you information, whatever. And then obviously the last thing that this article talks about is referral. Let's not be scared, it, you know, let's not be scared to refer and let's get a good physical activity referral network where I know I can, if I can't give this patient the exercise prescription that's needed, I know that my friend Luann can, can do it properly um, and, and, and refer. There's two things we have to remember for me. This is what we're trying to do. This is our aim. Our aim is trying to get people to move their particular way, just to move. And we're trying to get them to accomplish the 150 minutes at least a week and at least two days of some muscle strengthening. Okay? But it's their way. And then you work through it with them telling you what to do and they, and they will do it. You are defining an optimal health physical activity dose for your person. And then I've just used the word coach, but, but you coached him to attain that healthy goal, you know, as, as many times, as many weeks, forever as they can and to make it a healthy habit. So um, I've, I've finished slap bang on seven. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen. Um, wait a second. I've got to escape first. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then um, what I'd like to do is maybe, um, you know, there's lots of time for questions and I'm hoping that that's what we're here for. Fantastic, uh, Georgia. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I think you've made it clear to everyone on the call, at least the benefits of exercise. It's something that we all are aware of, but perhaps we don't know in such depth. And it, you've really expanded on the fact that it's beneficial in every system in the body. I particularly liked um, the fact that you said it's going to um, grow our brains um, yeah. and it's going to repair our hearts. Um, I kind of feel like after the six months of lockdown that I'm like that person in one of those stride studies saying that, uh, <laughs> that everything's got worse. Yeah. So, it's a downward error. <laughs> exactly. So I do have some questions for you. Um, okay. and, and I think you've touched on most of them and you've, uh, you've clarified most of the things. Um, but the first one I'd like, you, you, you've mentioned that any physical activity is good. Are there any types of physical activity that have been shown to be better than others? Um, not in terms of mode, not in terms of mode of activity. In other words, that running is better than playing soccer, is better than yoga. You know, it's, uh, in, in my research and in my, um, what I've read about, it's really what dosage we get from those activities. Um, okay. and so it's the volume, the, how, how you, you know, the volume that you're doing that will influence um, all these things that happen. But okay. the most, from a behavior change point of view, you know, the most important thing is that you've got to start a person with what they like. Um, and the self-efficacy has got to be high, otherwise they won't continue it. So, you know, I, I, I don't like swimming. I was forced to do it when I had an ACL and hated every minute. But, um, and my physio knows that. But the, 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 the interesting part for me is that um, I hated it, but there was a reason why I had to do it. So I did it. Um, so to get someone to do something they've liked in their previous younger years or something that they enjoy, you know, and for example, people dancing is a big thing for them. You know, they really like dancing, it seems. So I've often got non-movers to get moving by dance and then they've moved into more um, um, uh, structured uh, activities, you know, so 
yeah. So I, I haven't read that there's anything bad. Look, I'm a hockey player. So yeah, it's going to be bad because sometimes you get ACLs and balls, you know what I'm saying? So, yeah. um, I, from, but from a mortality and health outcome point of view, I haven't seen them. Great. And so, so any activity is, is good and anything is better than nothing. It's very, very important, and you saw that because the top part of that curve is where most of the benefit occurs quickly first, and then absolutely. it sort of tapers off. Absolutely. Speaking of which, I think you explained it quite nicely as well, but um, is there any point where it becomes too much exercise? Yeah. So there, has be, there, have been, um, there, there have been articles and studies that have shown that there is too much, and especially in running, um, 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 Dr. Carl Levy has done a lot with showing, um, and I can give the, the study if, if you like, um, so that we can circulate it. But he's shown that he first showed that running decreases mortality, but then he went and analyzed the very, very, very high volume runners. Okay. okay. And, and it's not where, where we would be. This is like ultra distance. Okay. And there, the, the, the mortality was not reduced. Um, you know, you also get, for example, um, um, where we get uh, in athletes, you know, very, very high level athletes because of the volume that they do, um, they get, the, you know, chronic fatigue syndrome or, you know, over, bad overtraining um, syndrome. But, um, and that's related again to the, to the telomeres. The telomeres have shortened. So you can see how a moderate amount, too vigorous, but a volume, again, 35 met hours though, has not been shown to be, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We're talking yes. beyond that. Now, if you calculate 35 met hours, that's a lot of hours of exercise in the week. Um, so, so, you know, and a lot of killer calories, which a normal average, our people we deal with are not getting to. Where we have to worry about too much exercise is your is your um, elite athlete and is the, the, the people that are doing ultra distance stuff. Okay. So Thank you. Yeah, that's a, that's, that's a good answer. Um, along the same lines of doing damage, are there any conditions or scenarios that require medical evaluation before prescribing? Right. Yes. Yeah. So um, there's definitely a process that the ACSM <laughs> has outlined in mm -hmm. terms of pre-screening and um, who goes where. Um, and this is, I think, important. Exercise as medicine, as, uh, that the accreditation course that we do, we, we cover this. And I do cover it with medical students because it's easy as a doctor to say, okay, I need to refer now, or I need to you know, medically clear this person, or not, or I need them, they can go on their own. Or I need them to have a supervised medical intervention, a, a, a medically supervised exercise program for a little while before they can go on their own. Um, so there is an algorithm um, that is, was introduced by the ACSM in 2018, um, the pre-participation uh, screening questionnaire, and it works on three things. Is the person active or inactive? What type of exercise is the person intending to do? Because if they just do, if, they, if they're intending to do moderate, then many times medical clearance is not, is not um, needed, but for vigorous it may be. And then the third thing, it, um, it's addresses are medical conditions and where the, they have identified three cardiovascular disease diabetes type 1 or type 2 and renal disease and those need medically supervised supervised programs if the person is inactive which many times those people come into the process inactive so they should go through a period of medical medically supervised exercise program and then after that they can be uh, uh, given over to a health professional um, of lower academic standing, if, if you want to call it that way. So there is a process whereby, um, uh, you know, um, someone will need to hold your hand for a little while and it is safe. Um, and, and that is really an algorithm that is done and ticked and uh, a practitioner can say yes or no, it's quite clear. And the ACSM have made it simple now. We used to do that all on risk factors. We used to go have to calculate so many risk factors you have. So you've got to go here and so many there. But now the system is very, very simple and it's taken away barriers for people starting to exercise, certainly moderate exercise. Okay, great. Oh, one um, last thing. When there's yes. signs and symptoms, 
signs and symptoms. That's why we've got to know signs and symptoms, whether during exercise or before exercise or after exercise. No negotiation, medical referral. Okay, that's a very good point. Um, you, you brought up the, the fact of intensity and you discussed it quite nicely, the different intensities. Um, you mentioned that there's um, most benefit um, with uh, duration of exercise, 150 to 300 minutes per week. How effective is exercise for weight loss and what is the most effective intensity for weight loss? Right, so this is the interesting part for me. Um, I, did my, um, I did my thesis, my PhD in metabolic syndrome, which obviously involved this whole um, body weight issue. And the recommendations from the ACSM, you have to look at the higher amount, 300 minutes um, of, ex of moderate exercise per week and even more to actually lose weight. Now, the reality with that is that it is, it is this is why it took me so long to finish my PhD because for people to actually accumulate that amount of time is very hard. Now this is then where intensity comes into play because if you can pinpoint a better intensity for that overweight or obese person, they can then exercise less, okay, which then makes it more possible. So that is where intensity becomes important in, where, in, in those cases with your, your overweight, with obesity, with metabolic mm -hmm. syndrome, where they, where they have to reduce their weight. And unfortunately, you need a lot of volume of exercise. So yes. if you can do high intensity, which has now been shown to be safe and good, um, that's where you put it in. Again, though, you've got, you know, the problem is you can't start someone on high intensity and then they yes. can't breathe and then they leave. You know, it's, it's behavior things that you've also got to um, Build think in. about. Yeah, yeah factor in. Um, you showed the slide of, of volume um, is a factor of the frequency, the intensity and the time. And I really like that. Um, yeah. And that's yeah. very good to and keep that's, in mind. Um, that's... That's really for um, uh, endurance exercise. And obviously when we talk about resistance exercise, which is just as important, that obviously is calculated differently from your reps, your sets, um, sometimes the speed of the, the weight. Um, so, you know, so that's a different calculation, but you know, we have to start people somewhere and often getting them to walk with an easy aerobic way is, is the quickest way to get them going. Simplest and quickest. And then you add in, you know, your resistance stuff, you know, push yes. a tree down or push your mate over, something like that. You know. Okay. Um, regarding time of day, is there an optimal time of day for exercise? Yeah. So, um, you know, it used to be thought, and when I was looking at data on, on, on weight loss, you know, because glucagon is reduced and our blood sugar levels are low in pre-breakfast, then maybe it was thought that that was the best time to actually lose weight. But there's, there, there, there wasn't enough research around that to make it conclusive. It's so un, unequivocal. So uh, certainly for diabetes, yes, there, there, there has to be a particular time of day that is best, and that's dependent on the medication the person is on, or when is the best time. You know, you've got, to, you've got to look at that for diabetic. But for the rest, it's really more important how you make it a habit in your day and in your week so that it lasts for... A, a lifetime. Okay, great. Um, an interesting question uh, from someone uh, watching this evening. You mentioned quite a lot about um, it, uh, the benefits of exercise on the brain. Mm. So in terms of neurogenesis and neuroplasticity, right. are, you, are you aware of any evidence of the longevity of the effect of in exercise on these factors? And okay. yes. once ceasing exercise, does the benefit wear off? Yeah, yeah. So um, that study that you saw in the um, in the in the presentation um, is of chronic effects. So I think, if I'm not mistaken, that was months, eight months or so. Okay. okay. So after they showed, so so in terms, of, then that exercise can last, but they were still exercising. Now the good the 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 point this person is bringing up, and it's a very good point, is we don't know enough, and there isn't enough research on the uh, longevity of these changes. So the STRIDE studies last year produced a 10 year reunion, and the paper's out, um, uh, of the same people. 
And what they interestingly find out is that the vigorous intensity, now you see here, here's intensity again. The guys who are in the vigorous intensity group maintain their CRF more than the guys that were in the moderate or low intensity group. Okay. So they, that is the first research that I've seen on longevity. And it is, I don't think we have enough of it um, okay. because I think what happens is that we don't know. We know chronic by 12 weeks, 20 weeks of exercising. We know also that there's the reversibility principle. So once you stop exercising, things are going to start backing up. But we don't know, especially for the brain, we don't know. I don't know. How I haven't much? seen any. Unless someone else in the group has, but um, I haven't seen any. But that is one of the fields of exercise physiology study that is trying to be unraveled now via yes. these, what they call the motor pack studies. Okay. that have been launched now that are that are specifically looking to map the molecular pathways and signaling pathways of exercise and what what they're going to do is map it first for acute and then follow and see what happens i think yeah it's it's definitely future research in my opinion. great yeah um an interesting question somebody points out in our busy daily lives that that often people don't exercise for not having enough time. So time stress can be a limiting factor to exercise. Yeah. Um, are there any studies that you're aware of about um, activities of daily living? For instance, housework, working in the yard. Um, leisure, caring, they call for, it a yes. leisure, leisure time physical activity, yes. yes. And LTPA is definitely, definitely um, um, affect health outcomes and mortality, yes. So us women should clean the house a lot more than you. <laughs> sure. That's, that's interesting evidence. <laughs> no, but definitely, yeah. So leisure time activity is very important. And that's why you can become clever in getting people to move by looking at what they do in their day. You know, okay. um, one of the big things I've realized is that since we, we were in lockdown and we had to um, not go to our office, my, my, um, activity level dropped and that's because yes. without me knowing i'm getting out the car i'm walking i'm going upstairs mm. i'm walking to a colleague i'm then walking to go get some lunch with a colleague i then maybe have a walking meeting and those are all leisure time physical activity so yes. um we have to try and increase that because that reduces sedentary behavior which is the other side of the coin okay and it all adds up yes um speaking of lockdown um somebody's got a question about um, a patient having anxiety attacks. Mm. Um, they're having anxiety attacks. And what is the, the best dosage, frequency, time, yeah. type of exercise that you could recommend for, for them? For right. someone? So, yeah. Okay. So I think we number one, if the person is open to calming techniques, breathing techniques, meditation, use those also. Okay. With exercise, we know, and as you saw in that um, article, that we try to aim for 17 kilocalories per kilogram of their body mass per week. That's the okay. aim that we're trying to get to. But often, uh, having worked with anxious and, and a lot of depressive uh, clients, um, you have to you have to feel. So, you start them with three minutes on the white bike, for example. You then have an RPE scale. Nothing fancy. RPE, um, discipline scale in, in this case. And you, you, you tell them that they must stop when they reach. So you never get them to be in pain or in, um, in, in overdrive mm -hmm. mode or where cortisol is released, but they stopping it. So what happens is that the next session I find the time goes up and the next the time goes up because uh, that, uh, that situation is no time for pain is gain. It doesn't work. So you've got okay. to get them to do it comfortably by these little scales and then build slowly on it, but give them control because anxiety and depression, a big factor is a loss of control. So when they're exercising with you, let them control that intensity themselves. And even okay. if they come to you for three minutes, it doesn't matter. The fact is they're getting up, they're walking, they're coming to you, build on that and, and, and affirm that and, you know, uh, okay. positive peak. Yeah. Again, again, highlighting the point that anything is better than nothing. Yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Shifting uh, slightly to a younger patient, I come from a pediatrics background and uh, we sometimes see overweight teenagers, etc. Would things change um, in the way you prescribe 
activity yeah. minutes or per week yeah. for a child? Yeah. The truth is that children, and you'll see in the physical activity um, uh, guidelines, uh, the, the um, advisory committee that I talked about in that resource, um, our children have to do more. Our adolescents mm. have to do more than what okay. I showed you now. The problem is that um, we've got to create those situations for them. So, um, and it's got to be things that they love doing. So, so you know, we... My biggest problem is that we don't break their day or their things enough. So, you know, um, my sister's really good at it, for example. She'll come and shout when we were in lockdown. She'll, she'll shout from downstairs to the kids. Time break. They have to get off their computers. They come downstairs. They go and kick the ball for five minutes. Then they, they're allowed to go back. So um, kids, kids are not very good unless they love sport and they're good at sport in structure things like a class or whatever. Yeah, as they get into high school, some of the ladies, for example, are like aerobics classes instead of PE classes. But I think it becomes important because they have to do so much more. And remember, only 25% only of our global children and adolescents are actually achieving that physical activity level. It's, it's worse for them than with adults. So my thing is that we, it, and it has to happen at school level more than anything, you know, um, um, and I suppose in our houses, but we have to just get opportunities of, without the kids knowing that they're moving, that they're running, that they're doing something, and happiness, you know, take the dog for a walk or whatever the case may be. But children are yeah. normally open. So like, I, if I don't tell my boy to come for a bike ride or whatever with me, he can stay there. He'll stay on his computer all day long. Okay. That's how, they, that's how they're wired, I think, now. Yeah. So but when, you, think, when you tell him to exercise, then he, he probably... They do he, enjoy he, it. They, they, yes. Yeah. Yeah, and it's not something, you know, allow them the choice too, because I'm telling you, a child enjoys something. You just got to find it and then work with that. Don't force Great. hockey on them if they don't like hockey. That's what I'm saying. So. Great. So what I'm taking out of this is that um, exercise is a tool that is available to us. Um, it's something that we need to be thinking of all the time, and it's something that we need to be using and prescribing for our patients and you've given us a nice overview of how to introduce it. Um, something is better than nothing. And, and finding what somebody's physical activity level is, finding what they're enjoying doing, and then um, building on that and working with that is a good place to start. Yeah, you listened to the talk. That was <laughs> Thank you. I was... Very good. <laughs> I, I, I was paying attention. Georgia, yeah. <laughs> thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for your presentation and the effort that you put into it. Um, please remind us that resource that we can go to, exercisesmedicine.org. So exercisesmedicine.org, it's the global. So if you just put in exercises medicine, it's the global page. Um, Exercise Medicine South Africa has kept that because there's nothing more we can add. Exercise Medicine South Africa is part of the SESMA website but um that website's got a huge amount of resources for you okay. that you can fantastic use. thank you so much um thank you very much for your time and excellent presentation um and now it's for me to advertise the next presentation that we have coming up and that is next week wednesday we have a very interesting presentation from some of the gurus in sports medicine and we're discussing about ethics in sports medicine and leadership um, to protect athletes and also to prevent physical abuse um, of our athletes. So we're shifting the focus a little bit towards ethics. There will be um, two CPD points available and ethics points available. Thank you to everyone for joining us this evening. Thanks again to our sponsors, Asino Lita. Um, thank you to John for being in the background and also um, a big thank you to our uh, presenter this evening, uh, Georgia Torres. Also, thank you to um, Nadine Peterson. She's our administrator, and she is the person who issues the CPD certificates. So if you just um, fill out the survey at the end of the webinar, uh, once we close the webinar, once you leave, you'll be directed to the survey where you can fill in your details. And just give us a, a couple of weeks to ensure that those certificates get to you there are lots of people joining each of these webinars, and so they will get to you eventually. If you take your phone out and you hover your phone um, over, I do apologize, the date for the ethics lecture, it's next week. 
Wednesday, that's the 21st. Um, if you hover your phone over that QR code over there, it should di direct you to the link where you can join up. So that's next week, Wednesday, the 21st of October at six o'clock. Thank you everyone for joining and thank you Georgia for your time. Good night.